Good to be with you again. We're now in the holy season of Lent. You know, it began as a time to prepare people for baptism, confirmation Eucharist, welcoming people into the church. And after some centuries, others said, hey, it's been a while since we were baptized, confirmed, <laughs> received Eucharist. We need to be renewed in that commitment. And so gradually the period was extended. It began really with a few weeks, what we now know as the latter half of Lent when the Gospel of John is read every day, and then extended, and then extended again to make it exactly 40 days. And yes, it's a time of repentance, of prayer, and especially of drawing close to Jesus in the mystery of the cross. I must admit, every Wednesday of the first week of Lent, I always think of my earliest days in the seminary, 1957-58. It was the year I spent in Collegeville, Minnesota at St. John's Seminary. And that year, the authorities decided that we should have another class added to the schedule, one semester of Hebrew, just to introduce us to the language in which most of the Old Testament's written and the thinking of people. Really, a language reflects a lot about the thinking of people. And at the end of that semester, Father William, who was our teacher, thought it would be really neat if each one of us would take one chapter of the Old Testament and come up with our own original translation. We had to take each Hebrew word and talk about the climate and all that stuff, you know, grammatically, and then come up with our translation. Well, of course, I looked through the Bible for the shortest chapter I could find. <laughs> And there it was in the book of Jonah the prophet in the third chapter, which is taken in English for the Mass of Wednesday, the first week of Lent. The story is, of course, of Jonah a prophet, and there really was one. We don't know anything about his real life. But it shows in the story that he received the word of God to go over to Nineveh, and convert them. Now, Nineveh may not mean much to you. You may have heard it more recently in all the battles and everything over in Iraq. It's in northern Iraq. At that time, it was the capital of the hated Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians have been called over the years the Nazis of the Middle East, of the Old Testament. So for the prophet to go to Nineveh and convert them, that was just crazy. They are the bitter enemies of the Jews. Nineveh had conquered Israel. And so we're told in the story that the prophet decides to go far away from Nineveh as he can. He gets on a boat going west in the Mediterranean Sea. And lo and behold, a great storm comes up. And everyone is saying, well, somebody on this boat is displeasing the gods. And they draw straws, and of course, it's Jonah who says, yes, I'm not obeying my God. Just throw me overboard and you'll all be saved. So they do it, and we're told a great fish happens to come by, swallows Jonah, and it's apparently the first atomic-powered fish in history because it's, in the story, it goes in three days, out the Mediterranean Sea, down the Atlantic Ocean, up the Indian Ocean, up the Persian Gulf, up the Tigris-Euphrates River, and deposits Jonah on the shore, and he sees the sign, welcome to beautiful downtown Nineveh. And so the story says, he says, well, I'll go in, I'll preach. They won't listen to me any more than the prophets of Israel were listened to by the people. 
and then God will punish them. He will destroy these enemies of Israel. And he goes in, as we hear in the passage used on the Wednesday, first week of Lent. He preaches and everyone repents from the king on down. Amazing. The greatest sermon ever given in history, I guess. And surprisingly, the book ends with Jonah pouting. He's upset. He was looking forward to them not repenting and then God would punish them and destroy them. Here they messed it up by repenting. And God has to appear to him and say, who are you to tell me what to do? If I gave to the Jews what I gave them, he gave it to those people that you look down on, the Goyim, the, the non-Jews, the, the Assyrians. If I gave them what I gave Israel, they would have listened. They would have repented. So it's a parable, like the parables of Jesus in the gospel. When Jesus one day gave this parable about the Good Samaritan, no one said, when exactly did this happen? What was the name of the Samaritan? What was the name of the man who was beaten up and all? No, it's a story created to teach a lesson, a powerful religious lesson. And so it's still valid for us today as Jesus himself cited it in his gospel. Yes, when we think of all that God has given to us, if we don't repent, he would have given to other people what he gave us, and they would have listened. They would have repented. So it's a very powerful message for us here in Lent. The whole 40 days, we're invited to remember who we are. The people of God, people of the new and eternal covenant, people who now even call God our Father. No other religion in history taught its adherence. You can call the God who created this whole world and governs everything and you can call him Father. And the scripture scholars say the word Jesus used, Abba, would be better translated, Daddy. It was an intimate term of affection used within the family circle by the children to refer to their daddy. Yes, our God has entered into a very intimate relationship with us as Christians. Children of God, through the gift of faith and the waters of baptism, members of the living body of Christ, living temples of his Holy Spirit. This is all what God has given us, his gift, his grace. And it's in this holy season that we remember the gift and what it costs our God in terms of the suffering death of Jesus, his beloved son. All these 40 days preparing us for that moment in the Easter celebration when we will renew our baptismal commitment to Christ, renewing our baptismal vows, realizing again that in baptism we have died symbolically with Christ in order to be raised up in a new life. That's what our Lent is all about. God bless you on all those whom you love. <clears throat>